Funky politics. Funky politics show. Funky politics. Funky politics. Funky politics. Funky politics. Powered by MLGW. Memphis like gas and water. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookian Network. I'm DC, one of your capable hosts of this program, and you know what? Memphis light, gas, and water. MLGNW is our presenting sponsor, and I tell you what, they do a wonderful job here serving our customers in Memphis. Doc Ward, what say you, brother? I say MLGW pays our bills. Uh-oh. Funky Politics solves your ills. Man, this show's so cold, it gives you chills. It's real right and funky. <laughs> I like that, man. No frills. That's what I say. No frills. I say it all day long. But let me ask you something. What you got? What you would got? You, would you? Would you? This is a question for you. For you, black man. Uh-oh. Would you give your fingerprints to the police department? Just offer them up and volunteer them without them asking you anything like that. Would you do that? No. You wouldn't? No. What about you, LT? Would you do it? Absolutely not. Okay. So why do you give your fingerprints to Apple when you go out and buy this phone and press it every time to identify you. I never thought about that. You never thought about it, but you didn't. And That's a lot of people. I never thought about that. Millions and millions of people wow. did not think about it, but I guess what? After this situation with Facebook and 37 million people in Rising whose information has been compromised, I bet you more people are going to be thinking about it. They said 87 million now. Yeah, yeah, because Facebook not only has your has your fingerprints, Facebook has your face, Facebook has your name, Facebook has your address, and guess what? They're packaging it up and they're selling it like like mortgages and securities right now. Wow. And what? that's what's got us in such an issue with these Russians out here. Because your identity has been compromised just by you owning the phone and gaining access to it. I never thought about that. Yeah. Never thought about it. Yeah. So as this election rolls along, and mm-hmm. I know, LT, you were telling us about all these people that are in the election. I'm happy to see so many people being active, but I want to see elections that have integrity. And if we got to go back to paper and pen and wait all night just so we can get it right, that's where I'm going to be. Because that's the thing that's most important to the public, I think, right now. So Mm. that's why you see so many women deciding that it's time to get back into this to have our issues addressed. I just read something that said that there are over 300 women who are running for Congress and in both parties, you know, trying to make sure that their voices are heard and their issues are addressed. Well, we want to make sure they're addressed, but we also want to make sure that the election is, is valid. Valid. Well, you know, speaking of women, women and issues, and you know, professionals, we've got one with us today, and Dr. Lisa Hausalter. That's right. Yeah, she is a capable uh, division director for the Shelby County Health Department, and you know what? She is a consummate healthcare professional known worldwide. And you know what? I'm glad she's here with us today, guys. You know that? Yeah. Well, she's not elected, but she is selected, yes, so right. she will be affected. So we got to make sure like that, that our elections are not infected. So we're going to talk to Dr. Hausalter in a minute. Right after we take a little time to relax and reflect on what we've been through and what we're talking about right here on this funky show, Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. Network. Funky Politics. Plus one lip sync champion, Latasha Peoples. Staring in the mirror, gonna change my ways. I wanna make Memphis a better place. I see a neighbor in me, but what can be done? Instead of buying shoes or a pretty dress with just a dollar a month, you can help the rest. It starts with you. Plus one. You know, giving back through plus one will make a difference for families in crisis. It starts with you. Plus one. Grandma's message couldn't happen any clearer. If you want to change Memphis, look in the mirror. It starts with you. Plus one. I remember when we got help from Plus One. And now we have another. Hey, Memphis, you can make a change. You too can make a difference. Artivism. Artivism features conversations with artists, creatives, and citizens working at the intersection of art and social activism. And I'm Linda Steele, your host. I'm a grant maker, change maker, social venture capitalist, 
And I invest in individuals and projects that use the arts as a vehicle for social change. Artivism on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! This is Dr. Elisa Househalter, and you're listening to Funky Politics on the Kazookian Network. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. I'm DC, sitting right here along with my great co-host, LT. How are you? Hanging in there today. How about you? I don't know. I'm doing pretty good. You know who else we got? Doc Ward. Doc, what's up? Somebody had to make this show funky again. And you brought yourself in. Thank yeah, you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, of course. It, it couldn't be funky without you. It couldn't be funky. Well, it actually couldn't be nothing without me, but it definitely Whatever. couldn't be funky. <laughs> this is Funky Politics. There folks. you go. And you know what? We're visiting this evening with Dr. Alisa Householder, who is the division director for the Memphis and Shelby County Health Department. What is it, the Shelby County Health Department now? It is the Shelby County Health Department. Oh, that's right. The Shelby County Health Department. Shelby Welcome County, to the program. How are you? Shelby County I'm Tennessee. doing great. I'm happy to be here. Yep. Good to have you back on this program. Let's just, you know what, we want to talk a little bit about the background, your background in terms of public health. Uh, you're not native to Memphis. Uh, as a matter of fact, you come from a lot of different places and have been a lot of different places. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the inner city of Go Pittsburgh. Steelers! I'm Go sorry. Steelers! I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, guys. That's okay. I grew up right by the stadium, so I'm All a right. Steelers fan. Um, we wrap our children in the terrible towel at Absolutely. birth. Absolutely. Wow. And that's how we do it there. But I spent 30 years in Nashville. I'm retired from public health practice there. Then spent three years in Delaware, and then came Delaware, Delaware, yes. Wow. At the Dupont Institute, which is um, Nemours Healthcare System yeah. for Children. Then I was recruited back to public health practice here in Shelby County, and I'm happy to be here. I've been here for two years. Wow. Wow. From the Berg to the Ville, across to Delaware. Guess what? The doc's been everywhere, but right now she's here with us to talk about something very, very important. Yep. And very, very funky in a not so positive way. And, you know, I think it's been about a, has this been about a year or two since we lost Prince? Was it? Two yeah. years. A couple April. Of years. Has it been two years already? Two years. April yeah. 20, because okay. I'm it, April 20th. I know, and they're getting mm-hmm. ready for. Ask me for, how I know. <laughs> yeah, there's a celebration <laughs> and uh, a bunch know. of things that are going on in Minneapolis pretty soon. But I think that, I believe, at least for me, yeah. it was the first time that we actually came face to face with the. Opioid, uh, uh, was it a drug or whatever it's a substance called fentanyl? I had never, I had never heard of it before. Really, mm-hmm. I'd heard of maybe vaguely. Uh, I was still getting over the propofol with Michael Jackson. Well, now that's know. true. That is but, very so, true. So I heard this new thing that was supposed to be, you know, thirty times more powerful than, you know, Tylenol, seventy times more powerful, or whatever. But that was when I think we really first started hearing about it when he expired due to an overdose or uh, amount of, and then all of a sudden, just like. Uh, you know, like a blizzard or whatever. Everything started rolling down and rolling down and rolling down. And all of a sudden, you started hearing in places like West Virginia, uh, uh, Kentucky, and Pittsburgh, uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, where you were from. It became an epidemic levels. This whole issue with opioids, and we found out that we had actually been confronted with it as a nation for some time now, and it had yet been unaddressed. Is that now? Is that not correct, Doctor Hoss? I would say it's not been adequately addressed. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then I would also add there's some communities like Pittsburgh, Baltimore, that have had a historic um, heroin addiction problem and that evolved into an opioid problem with fentanyl and some others. So uh, for each community, it's a little bit different. I think that's the key point. So can you kind of explain to us what that's all about? Because it's actually now it's on the front page, on the front lines of, of all the news issues we have now. Well, it's really reached the epidemic proportion. And what we know is different about this than the historic problems we've had with heroin is that this was really fueled by the pharmaceutical industry and prescribing pain right. medications for individuals. So fentanyl is a really strong painkiller. That's good for people who have terminal cancer, or chronic pain. But if you have your wisdom teeth out, you don't need fentanyl. And so there was overprescribing. People got addicted to it. Mm-hmm. Many of these synthetic um, substances, the pharmaceutical company told providers, physicians, nurse providers, that they were not as addictive. And they actually are very highly addictive. So individuals became addicted to what was prescribed. Then we stopped prescribing. So they went to the street to get either heroin or other um, 
products that are actually being made in China, Mexico, and other places and brought into our community. Wow. Wow. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kentucky Network. So when you talk about community, oftentimes we hear about the big cities who are starting to face the epidemic, but I used to live in Western PA, and I know in Fayette County that was a problem. Can you talk to us about any differences between how the epidemic is affecting rural communities versus urban communities? So with a lot of urban communities, there was a historic opioid or opiate um, addiction that was related to heroin. Mm -hmm. If you go to Pittsburgh, people have been using heroin for a long, long time, really back to the 1900s, um, 1920s even, very, very early, and peaked in the 1950s. But you had very rural communities. Um, if you look at the state of Tennessee, East Tennessee is really the nexus for the current opioid crisis, and much of that is through prescriptions that were provided by providers to individuals, and then there became sales of those pills. It's a little bit different. Well, why so, is East Tennessee the nexus versus anywhere else? It's just the way that it kind of developed over time. Those are communities that also used meth, um, mm -hmm. where uh, inner city communities may have used crack or heroin. So uh, any community is slightly hmm. different. The same thing with violence. It's not the same in Memphis as it is in Nashville. There are different things that contribute. So if you're going to solve the problem, you really have to look local. Well, so is that part of the Appalachian ahead. Trail kind of thing? Because, Or is there just something about Eastern Tennessee? I'm just curious about that. Uh, it's just being in a rural community. Okay. And then there was access, easy access to providers who prescribed. Okay. So you're saying people want to get high. They don't have access to the same type of drugs that other people do. So they get what they can. And one of the things they could do was get this synthetic well first of all the first opioids you said were actually prescription drugs well no to the, the degree the current the current epidemic is from prescription drugs right, but right. but opioids really come heroin is an opioid right yeah. right and I, I think we need to make the distinction to yeah. our listeners also yeah. because you know we've talked yeah. to colonel wright with uh, with mpd uh, that's memphis police department and they've, they've laid it out for us on some other shows mm -hmm. uh to, let, let's talk about opioids being there, there's just not one thing here right. I think heroin yeah. and fentanyl follows into that with uh, some of that and then you've got those prescription pills am I right am I not right doc yeah there's any of the painkillers that you get prescribed the majority of those are going to be an opioid so let's just say most oxycodone oxycodone but it may be Tylenol with codeine which right. a lot oh, wow. of people yeah. have taken Vicodin Vicodin okay. all of those are actually opioids and highly addictive Wow. Good night. So, so like we're saying, in the rural areas, you might not have access to the same types of, of, of substances, so you get what you can. But now with this synthetic coming in, you said pharmaceutical companies are, were, are to blame or are consider, considered to be to blame to some degree for it. Where, how are the pharmaceutical companies getting involved in the sort of, I say, black market side of it? If you're not prescribing it, you're getting it off the black market. How are they involved in that, or are they involved in yeah, it? Yeah, so I'll just be clear. I didn't say they were to blame. I think okay. it's a contributing factor yeah. that they may— Well, I'm sorry. The president said they were to blame. That's I'm okay. i put that on you. But I want to add to that because I'm a provider. I'm a nurse by okay. training. That at the same time that the pharmaceutical companies were developing all these synthetic drugs to manage pain, healthcare providers were being told that pain was the fifth vital sign— and we actually are scored on whether or not our patients report that they had pain or not. That's right. Okay. So then the provider started over-prescribing because they didn't want patients to be in pain. So we really all have contributed to that. Right. Then you look at all the marketing that's on TV. So you have patients, me or someone else, who will go in and demand something to manage the pain. So it's a combination of all of those things together that I think have contributed the pharmaceutical industry, as they've pulled back, as we stop prescribing, we know what happens in a business model. Right. Those who sell drugs started manufacturing illegally right. similar drugs and then bringing them into the community. And people who were already addicted then started using those things from the black market, including heroin, including mm -hmm. fentanyl that's made elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we talked about Prince earlier. Right. You know, the sort of a belief that he didn't know he was buying fentanyl or whoever purchased it oh, for him. Oh, come on, Doc. Come on. He knew he was buying an opioid, right. but he didn't know how much uh, fentanyl strong, okay. was in there. Yeah. Right. And so that's why we have the overdoses because there's really no quality control on the black market. But 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 if I'm but if I'm buying that drug, I, I want the pain to go away. So whatever it is, I just know it makes the pain go away. Right? I don't know if it's fentanyl, it could be barbiturate. I mean, whatever it is, right. I just want it to go away. Mm-hmm. And so how is it that I can go to a doctor, and I've got a prescription. I've got a prescription for 
uh, 90 pills in a, in a one month period. To me, that, isn't that you said that I can take this three times a day. Come on, on yeah. some strong stuff like that. Now that's isn't that a little bit over over the top for a doctor to prescribe? I'm not talking about the manufacturer. I'm talking about the physician. Well, see, it makes me question the profitability of these drugs, right? So at the end of the day, if the doctors are prescribing more, are the pharmaceutical companies pushing it because these are more profitable than some of the other drugs in their portfolio? So can you speak to us about whether or not it helped the medical institutions make money or close the gap? Uh, I won't necessarily say about profitability. One of the things that does happen is if a patient is discharged and they come back within so many days, the provider is penalized for that. Wow. And because of the pain? Because you didn't address the pain? Well, whatever reason they come back. Right. So just say I had surgery and I come back in two or three days and I'm saying my pain's not controlled. The provider actually is penalized. So there is a financial motive. It's not necessarily profit in the way that you're discussing profit. And all of those things are being addressed in the current opioid epidemic. The other is really encouraging patients to have a conversation with their provider. Mm -hmm. I have had surgery. I did not take those pain pills. I knew there were other options and so I demanded other options and not to have something that was a synthetic And I I think that's that's why we get it here first and we get it right and we get it always right here on Funky Politics on the Kazuki Network. And I think the key word, the options. There are other options to this this continued use of, of strong painkillers. And that's what they are. I mean, but they're painkillers, but they're eventually killing some, because they're falling into hands of somebody who should not have them. Yes. And that's where the black market comes in. Exactly. Mm. So how did this get defined as an epidemic? What was the trigger that made someone say, we need to address this growing problem in the country? So that's a really interesting question, because even within the health department, we had a lot of discussions about the term epidemic. But the actual meaning of that term means that you have deaths that exceed what you would have expected for an issue. Okay. That we know is true with opioids. But then we have to begin to look at addiction as a chronic illness and not a moral or behavioral problem. It is a chronic mm. illness. And so if we had people dying from diabetes left and right, we would call it an epidemic. If we had people who had measles, which we've had measles here, we would call that an epidemic. So that's the right term to use so that we can look at it from a public health issue and not a law enforcement. So if you go back to the 90s and we always compare the crack epidemic to, you know, this opioid epidemic. And so what's the difference in the sense of urgency in comparing the two? Because people died as a result of crack overdose as well. It wasn't a crack epidemic. That's the difference. Well, that's the truth. Now, that, now she just said that it, you know the epidemic piece of it was the crack right. uh, co- was, was the crack issues that we had in the eighties and then was that considered an epidemic from a public health standpoint? As a public health professional, I would say the crack problem we had in the eighties was an epidemic. Did the was it defined? But, but did the president, the president didn't define that's it that way. That's what I'm saying. You're saying it retrospectively. Didn't say, yeah. We didn't have we didn't have a crack epidemic. You had a crack problem. You didn't have a crack epidemic. It's just, what, what, but what we all just, know that the, the reality of what was happening on the street. Yeah, that's true. That's that true. There were problems and people were dying right. and people were sick. Sure. And, and, and yeah. a lot of the same, yeah. I guess, characteristics that mm-hmm. we see in opioids we saw in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Right. But you didn't have a crack, crack epidemic. It wasn't called that. It was, and therefore you so, could not address it as a public health So what's issue. the difference? Is it because the president has come forward or the, the previous administration called it, termed it an epidemic? I think it's a combination of things. First and foremost, I think we've learned a lot about the crack epidemic. Mm-hmm. We cannot arrest our way out of addiction in our country. We have to take a broader approach. So that's one thing that I think we need to recognize, that there was lessons learned through what happened in the 80s. The other is, and this is my opinion, I'm not speaking on behalf of necessarily anybody else, <laughs> is there are other people who have been impacted by the problem now. Right. And it's hmm. hit closer to home, so they have a better understanding of the reality. But not who's home, them. though? Who's home, though? Has it hit closer to, though? And I, and I don't want to call you on the carpet on yeah. that because it hit close to home, you know, in my family back in the, mm-hmm. in the 70s, I mean, I in the 80s. It. Yeah, so, there's no, there's so nobody, now, now no, who's home now? Nobody in Congress looked like your family. Oh, well, then that, that's true. Maybe, maybe, maybe Walter Fontroy. Maybe I mean. working in the kitchen. In but, but anyway, but, but I, I get your point. I mean, but you're happening. right. Hitting closer to home, and I think that's where we are now with this what opioid epidemic. Yeah, and it wasn't a crack epidemic, you know. So go go, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, well, I mean, we, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it. We're not going to we're not gonna dance around it. We're no, gonna no, get no. funky with it. But you're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. It's I Conversation. Elliot Perry, otherwise known as Socks. Man, thank you. How you guys doing? Mr. Earl the Pearl Monroe. Hey, thank you. Nice to be with you guys. Glad to have Mr. Allen Houston. Trying to stay warm up here in New York. I hear you. Personality extraordinaire, Mr. Scoop Jackson. Uh, I appreciate the encore. Mr. Michael Ray. Richardson. What's up, man? Glad to be here, brother. A three-time NBA All-Star, the one, the only, Detlef Shrimp. All right, Larry, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. I Conversation. The Kintsuki Network. Kintsuki Funky Politics. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. I'm DC, sitting right here along with LT and Doc Ward. How are y'all? Man, funkier than collard greens, sweat socks, and something. That's funky. That's funky. Yeah. That's yeah. funky. Yeah. That's yeah. Really yeah. funky enough. Yeah. Is it funky enough? Yeah, yeah. chilling to that, and then you on a roll. Oh, you know? my God. Hey, before, <laughs> look, before you get the membrane out. Oh. <laughs> look, we've been visiting with Dr. Lisa Haushalter, our wonderful uh, division director of the Shelby County Health Department, and just, we are just great. To, we just it's wonderful to have you on our show again, uh, Doctor yeah. Halsalter. I'm happy to be here. Well, I can just see the the flowing on your face, the happiness on your face. You should. You know what? We were we were setting this thing up and talking about uh, the opioid versus a crack uh, epidemic. And keep saying that. Um, excuse me. No excuse crack the epidemic. Opioid epidemic versus the crack problem we had. Go. And from a, a, a black white perspective in our communities, let's let's get into that right quick. Let, let's go there. I want to get in depth of what's the difference well, now. You, you just that's the difference. What? What? Black that's the white? difference. Yeah. Show's over. You just did it. Okay. No, so but right I, there. I mean, but that but that was the difference. But that's, that's but but the question is, so from a policy perspective or a calling, how did one become named an epidemic? Versus the other one was a problem, as MD said. Funky politics. <laughs> Always. <laughs> I mean, no, really that's what funky. It was. There yeah. you go. And we put you on the spot on this show, by the way. <laughs> no, I want to be on the spot. There you there go. You that's go. what I'm here for. You're here. First, we got to remember we've learned a lot since the 80s. So even our understanding of addiction has grown considerably. And thinking of addiction as a public health problem is probably newer thinking. It's much like violence. I've been here before talking about violence. Right. We haven't necessarily historically thought of violence as a public health issue. It is a public health issue. So I would say we've evolved quite a bit. But also the impact of the opioid crisis or epidemic, whichever term you want to use, is impacting a broader population. And I think that's caused more of a response. Also, you have an outcry from the public health world as well as medical professionals saying, look, something needs to be done here. We're losing too many people. I said earlier, we can't arrest our way out of this. Unfortunately, many families in the inner cities of America have been damaged not only because they had family members on crack, but those individuals ended up in prison. They have felonies, they can't get jobs, and it's just a downward cycle into poverty. And so I think we have to look back and say we did not handle that well as a country and that that's impacted our families and neighborhoods in the South. Urban communities are um, primarily African-American, but there's northern communities that are mixed, both African-American and white. So I would also say urban environments where people live in poverty were impacted heavily by the crack epidemic. So, 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 taking what you just said about you know the whole we, we're going to go to prison now you have a felony and stuff like that, how are prisons responding to treating inmates who go into the system for drug treatment or something like that? What are they doing to prevent them or or to take them through treatment in the system so that when they come out they're clean and they stay clean? Really great question because there's a lot of newer things happening that haven't happened before. So we've always had detox in the local jails and in the and the prisons. They're usually doc, detox by the time they get to prison. But in the jails, we detox. People can go into different types of treatment, including um, 12-step programs and so on. 
but there's actually some newer drugs that can be used. A lot of people are familiar with methadone. It's been around a long, right. long time. Mm -hmm. But in addition to methadone, we have um, buprenorphine, which can be taken daily. And then we have something called Vivitrol, which is an injection. So there are some jails across the U.S. that give Vivitrol at discharge from the jail so that they don't use again. They have a 30-day window. They get into treatment when they're out into the community, and then the, the goal was to keep them in treatment. So we have a lot more treatment options as well. Well, now, now methadone, and, and you're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Net uh, Network, but now methadone, those clinics that have been around for years, mm -hmm. uh, are they using a, another drug to replace a drug? When I was in social work school, we always talked about in order to correct a behavior, you got to replace it with a behavior. So, so. Are those clinics and are the other clinics around the country that are using similar methods, are we just replacing one addiction with something that's similar or l a little bit less than what they're, they're coming into the cl clinics for? So it shouldn't be that someone just walks in the door and gets methadone or sure. walks in and gets buprenorphine. They really also need to get treatment. Um, there was a comment made earlier about people wanting to get high. What we know fundamentally is people who use drugs have some type of pain. Usually that's emotional oh, pain. Yeah. And so how do we help people deal with that pain and be able to manage their addiction as a chronic illness? And sometimes that means that you take medication as well. So I saw something today that the Surgeon General Jerome Adams, I think is his name. He his name is Jerome? Yeah, his name yes. is Jerome. And he looks like Jerome. Yeah. Oh, I could, like I could, Jerome who? Yeah. He, he, Jerome, what is Jerome? Stereotypically, what is Jerome? Kind of got on the way anyway, I don't know. It, anyway, we're getting we're fast. I actually heard that he made a statement today that um, people should carry more of the opioid overdose antidote, and he suggested that we make naloxone available more readily available for the epidemic. So, what's your statement about that being available as a treatment option or a uh, antidote for? Um, Opioid. I support that it should be widely available. Is it financially feasible for people to have it readily available? So that's part of the problem is that it does cost. I don't know the cost from pharmacy to pharmacy. And so for some individuals, they're not able to afford it. So access is not just availability. It has to be affordable as well. Um, you know, really encouraging people who have family members or friends who are addicted to opioids to have an antidote available. That's um, naloxone or Narcan is the name brand. Yeah, the Narcan piece, yeah. And some people just cannot afford to do that. So that's sort of the next wave of how do we make it affordable so that everyone has access. I thought it was interesting that this is the first time that the Surgeon General has actually issued, you know, the request to have it have one available. This is the first time since 2005. So it's been 13 years since the Surgeon General said that based on an epidemic, we need to have an antidote available. And that came out today. Yeah. So it's one of those things that 13 years, and we've all lived through a lot of different, you know, I'm, I can't say epidemics, but problems, but for it to become that urgent and rise to the top. But what's that for? That, does that address crack cocaine as no. well no no so then we still don't we still have not solved that issue no but so it, we still have racial disparity even amongst the addicted but i think what i think what dr Househalter is saying though is that looking back it just wasn't handled properly okay, man, I, okay. From, from a national I, perspective I, I, I'll it wasn't buy that. i'll buy that but 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 she said i mean what what can you do now to go back because and, people are getting high today on crack it's well that's not like, true uh, so you got families destroyed in the 80s and the 90s absolutely and one thing that they we can't get those lives back and one thing that we did not address is that you have a whole generation of children that are the offspring of the users of crack cocaine that a public education system is going through all types of somersaults to find a way to deliver an educational product to them that will allow them to be mainstream in society to some degree in most urban areas but but people are still getting high off crack crack is probably still more accessible than any other drug because one thing about it if you're getting black market opioids you're still getting black market opioids you got to go through a process for that you can get track on the street right now we can walk right outside of kazuki and uh studios well maybe not kazuki and studios but somebody's studio <laughs> and we'll be able to to access crack cocaine today people are still and more importantly crack is also affixed in the criminal justice system the sentences for crack cocaine under the sentencing guidelines much higher than cocaine much still? higher than marijuana much higher than heroin still have not been addressed and equalized to a point to where we are 
looking at crack cocaine the same way we're examining the opioid crisis. You still have crack cocaine that's been mainstreamed in as a criminal problem. So, has so how are we going to unask that situation and get to a point to where we're treating all substances that have addiction rates at epidemic proportions with all treated the same? So, so I need a better understanding of this. Has opioid been criminalized the way opioid addiction been criminalized the way crack addiction was criminalized? I'll put it to you this way. I'll put it to you this way. From a legal perspective, I have not seen uh, opioids. Uh, the sentences in the United States sentencing guidelines illuminated the way they are for cocaine base, which we know is crack. Yeah. So I don't see that now. Of course, if you are selling it, you will go. You will call. You will go to prison. But the time frames under the sentencing guidelines are different, and they are disparate from those of crack cocaine. But how much of that is because the sentences have changed themselves? So, like the sentences for crack cocaine has been lessened, but not to the same degree. And all I'm saying is that if you're going to pass the legislation. Let's make it omnibus legislation. Let's look at those those drugs, those substances, opioids, which include heroin, which include fentanyl and, and big pharma's uh, black marketed drugs and so on. And let's include also Schedule II uh, narcotics like crack cocaine and cocaine to some degree. Let's look at all of them. And also let's look at marijuana as well as it becomes legal throughout the United States and soon will probably be legal through most of the United States. Let's look at the sentences for all of those and let's equalize them. Let's put together some real drug policy that's based on the number of people using and the damages and the effects as we should that come from the science and not the social aspect of it such as where it's found, who's dealing it, who's making money off of it, and so on and so forth. You're listening to Funky Politics powered by the Kazuki Network. Now, Doc, I think that's a fair statement that Doc has made. Have we gotten to the point that we're looking at this thing from a health standpoint versus a criminal standpoint? And what is the health departments and what are your other colleagues around the country doing in their local communities to tell the federal government that, look, we still have an uneven playing field where the crack addicted people are still being treated as though they're criminals. But now we've got this new deal where the president said we're going to attack the opioid crisis with everything we've got from a treatment standpoint. Even though it took him forever to designate. Yeah, but but he did do it. But he did do it, right. But nobody's done it for the crime. And we still have that issue here, even in our local community here. Would you not say, Doc? Oh, I agree. You know, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm I'm not going to speak to all the laws because I don't know that they actually are as disparate. Um, Sales of of narcotics have heavy sentences regardless of the narcotic. I think what's important to think through is that in order to reduce the impact on our communities we have to focus on prevention so assuring that people don't have access whether that's to opioids or crack that doesn't change that's that should be the same model. People should have access to treatment for addiction regardless of what they're addicted to and Mm. those are the things that we advocate for. Mm. What we're not talking about that I think is really critical, we have to have a community that supports recovery. Once individuals go into treatment and come out, what is in place to assure that they stay sober over time? We also know people relapse. So how do we create a community that's caring and compassionate for recovery? And as a public health professional, I can advocate for those things. I can also work with law enforcement partners to try to get people into treatment and not into the criminal justice system. As a health director, we're actually responsible for inmate health for all county inmates. So we're actually working with UT to say what's the best model for any of our um, inmates who are addicted, regardless of that substance, so that they can get treatment. So I think from my um, sort of sphere of influence, I'm trying to make sure that we treat addiction um, regardless of the substance from an equitable perspective. And, you know, and the University of Tennessee Health Sciences mm-hmm. is sitting in the city, in this county, and they have all types of resources. Have they actually come to the table and said, let's, let's, get, let's get together with the police department, let's get together with the health department, and let's solve this, this crisis we have, not just the opioid crisis, but have they talked about in any measure about solving the issue we still have in our communities with crack? But is that theirs to drive? No, no. You, you've got a, a, a major medical facility sitting over there. If we're talking about health disparities, then why not it come from a place over there that can talk about it from a professional standpoint? So we that's have, all I'm saying. We, ha- we have come together. Oh, we have now. Thank God. So that's been public health. That's been Dr. Stern at UT. Yeah. It's been um, 
Memphis Police and Fire, as well as Sheriff's Office and um, County Fire EMS Chief Benson, as well as elected officials to develop a comprehensive approach to addressing the opioid epidemic. But I've consistently said in those meetings, if this model works, it can be applied to other things. It's not limited to opioids and that we have to partner across and use technology to be able to help us share information so that people get into treatment earlier. So how does that success model that you're working on here that you have started with at the operational level get transferred to Nashville to the legislative level where policy has changed affecting this? So I can tell you, I know that UT has been at the legislature for the past weeks and months to really look at treatment. UT has what's called an addiction science center. It's not an opioid science center. So they're focused on addiction more broadly. And I know that they've had lobbyists at the state level trying to influence policy there to focus on treatment and allocating money. One of the things that we didn't talk about is if you look across the state, Shelby County actually has less deaths from opioids. So we're not likely to get a lot of resources because we're behind everyone else. Is it because this is urban and you talk about eastern Tennessee being rural and that, that whole yeah, difference? Yeah, just, just, no, and because you got people here that use crack cocaine. These are black people live in Memphis. And that's what you're going to have. Okay, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, you, it might sound ugly when you say it because it is ugly when I say it. And people need to hear it it's ugly so they can get part of doing something about it. Not Dr. Househalter. Yeah. She's doing what she can, but other people that are listening. You have where you have African Americans, you don't have as many opioids. I think Prince might be one of the, and I'm talking off the cuff. He's in Prince Minneapolis. Might be, too. Yeah, he's in, but he's in Minneapolis. <laughs> he it's was different. in Minneapolis. Yeah. So, so, yeah, of course it is. Mm-hmm. But if you flip that and talk about crack, we're probably number one on a, on a rocket ship. Well, I'm not going to agree to us being the number one uh, spot on the rocket ship, but I will say that, you know, in terms of Af- African American community, with respect uh, to crack, it, it's up there. The Tennessee oh, rocket ship. The Tennessee rocket ship. You want to call it the Tennessee? That you crazy? The Tennessee rocket. Ship. But you know what? We, we've got a lot to do in our communities. But I will tell you what. Let's let's do this. We're going to be right back. We're going to talk to Doctor Househalter about some other community uh, activities that are going on out there that are not getting as much support. So you're listening to Funky Politics right here on the Kazuki Network. Politics. Riffin on jazz. This next gentleman we're talking about has an unforgettable voice. My sugar is so refined. Jazz was the happiest. Yeah, that's the way went to my school. Oh, really? Yes, he's not an alum because he didn't graduate. He has some gigs to do. <laughs> Griffin on jazz on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian. This is Dr. Elisa Househalter, and you're listening to Funky Politics on the Kazookian Network. Back at you with another funky politics right here on the Kazuki Network. I'm DC sitting along with my coloring buddy over there. Doc Ward, how are you, Doc? I said coloring buddy. No, I didn't say no, colored no, buddy. No, I no. Didn't say that. That's totally not true. That's not true? You no. don't color? No. And not, not with you at all. <laughs> LT, how are you doing now? I'm not even talking to this guy. Over here. I don't even know where to go into this. I'm I, doing great. You're doing great, good. <laughs> Man, I need to give you a book on urban jar- jargon. Because coloring buddy was it, wrong? It's totally wrong. Yeah, maybe I should take yeah. buddy out. Okay. Uh, I'll just take it all out. Take it all out. I want to take it out. Hey, yeah. sitting here with Dr. Alisa Haushalter, our wonderful uh, division director of the Shelby County Health Department. Uh, sitting in just, man, we, I tell you, we're having a great conversation yeah. with you, Doc. How are you? I always have a great conversation when I'm here. Let me tell you something. When you're here on Funky Politics, it that's just, it just lifts up the yeah. room in this place. That's usually now. because D.C.'s not here. It's usually because <laughs> <we're> us <just> talking <laughs> about things. Then we can have good conversation. You know, I you want know. to put on a spot today, though. I want to talk about something that I know is dear to a lot of people's hearts, and, and that's this, uh, it's, it's this piece on women's health and how I think there is a, I believe, in my opinion, that there is a all-out assault on one particular agency who has, I think, down through the years, have served women in terms of women's health, not no just with, no pun intended, yeah, yeah, well, not with just reproductive health, but with other other issues, and the Congress, the president, most of the state governors around, especially the red state governor, are attacking Planned Parenthood. What is the deal, Dr. Househalter? What's the deal? Even in our own state, even in our own state of Tennessee, we roll back funding for what I believe is a is a most needed service that they provide. I'm going to reinforce the need for people to vote 
oh, wow. and get involved in policy and politics. So our elected officials make policy based on those who put them in office. And that's at the state level, it's at the local level, it's at yeah. the federal level. And so policies around funding of Planned Parenthood have come out of elected officials. Once they set those policies, unfortunately, as um, a public servant, we have to defer to those sure. to right. those policies. But I think the broader item is about access to reproductive health services for not only women but men as well. And there are a variety of organizations that provide those services. The, the health department, we provide those services, as does um, many FQHCs and other health care providers and Planned Parenthood. But, but, you know, but as a health professional for well over 30 years, I mean, some of this stuff that's coming out of these legislators, legislators' mouths, you've got to be sitting back and just scratching. You're like, what in the heck are y'all doing? Well, I mean, it's even. Well, you but, 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 you know, we'll talk about it just straight up. Let's talk about in the, in the context of what's going on, because I think what you had was a situation where the former director, Planned Parenthood now, has come out and said that she felt like she was bribed by the president's daughter and her husband when they talked to her about potentially uh, uh, providing her with some additional funding if she would stop funding abortions or at least decrease what funding for abortions. I didn't hear that part. You heard that part? No, I didn't. Oh, wow. That's in the news, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everybody else has heard it. Haven't you heard it? No, I haven't. Oh, okay, well, I'm sorry. maybe that's too. Sure, that's, that's not fake news. Though, right? I don't know <laughs> if it's fake or not, but that, but that's really what the situation is uh, right now going on with them, and so uh, one of several. But it's but it's but it's to the larger point that people believe that Planned Parenthood is about nothing else but providing abortions. It's about but when when really the uh, the, the as Doctor House Hunter was saying, the subject matter is women's reproductive health care in all all forms. In, in all forms and fashions, and that which is vital to the life of a woman, you know. So you, know, you can go on from there, but I'm just saying that's that's what it comes down to, and the values that people have, particularly in those certain areas and clusters where they believe that Planned Parenthood is doing nothing else but providing abortions so and the religious beliefs and everything else associated with that. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. I grew up in a rural community that didn't have Planned Parenthood, but we did have a local, you know, health clinic that, you know, young people went to to get services and things like that. So with all the debate that is discussed nationally about Planned Parenthood, are more funds being given to the local health um, services or local health clinics to help address some of the need? Yeah, the, for amount, reproductive the, rights? the amount of funds hasn't necessarily changed. It's just distributed to other agencies, which is what I said earlier. There are a lot of agencies that provide reproductive health services. The health department is one of those. Mm -hmm. Choices is another one of those. Planned Parenthood is another. And any of the federally qualified health centers generally provide services as well. So if you're a young person, you know, a young woman in a rural community, you can still go to your public health department and you can get birth control or any types of birth control. You can get the testing uh, for your health and all of those things. I want to make sure that everybody understands that we put all this focus on Planned Parenthood, right. but there's still other means and other avenues out there of getting those services. Definitely, and yes. a so local health department is one of the places that individuals can go for services, and we're talking about women's reproductive health, but men also mm -hmm. can receive services. No, 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 I, I hear you, Doc. I hear you, and I hear Doc Ward, and I hear LT, but Excuse I want to get to the meat of this thing. They're, they're cutting the funding to Planned Parenthood, and, and, and it's only because of abortions, because they have, uh, in the past, uh, assisted with terminating uh, pregnancy. Let's just call that's it what it is. But that's really but, only like 3% of the but, services. But, 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 the number, but now because of 3% of services, you take out 97% of help to, to rural and, and so, urban see, communities? See, that's not what are? I heard, because rural communities don't have Planned Parenthood. That's the but, thing. But, but if you get access to, if you got access to, let's just say, let's say you live in Stuttgart, and Stuck. you come to, or Stuttgart, you, you come to Memphis, or you come to Marion County, then guess what? If the funding levels have been cut by the fine state of Arkansas and the fine state For of Tennessee. Planned Parenthood, but what yes. I heard Doc say right. is that I can still go to my local health department for all of my other needs. But there are some things that they cannot provide at the local health department. Am I not right? That some of these, like Planned Parenthood, can provide. And I'm just under, please make me under, and I'm not, of course, not a lady, so I'm not going there to get those things, but I'm sure there are some things that you all cannot provide that they do. Generally, 
all of the reproductive health services are going to be available at a local health department or other F, like federally qualified health care centers. Those services are available. What we don't provide is abortion services. But we never have, though, have we? No. We never have. Okay. So you can. So you still get your needs addressed. And I understand that the, the money. But the is state be- provided the monies for those for those young women for those people that have those issues. At some point, Planned Parenthood was getting money to do something, and they, and, and well, I guess the, the addition of the private funding probably was paying for these uh, these termination services. No doubt. They receive Planned Parenthood receives funds from a variety of yeah. ser- and some of it was through federal funds that actually come through the state. It's not pass-through all funds, state dollars, yeah. federal pass through dollars, yeah. as well as donations, and you can pay for services. Yeah. So it's a combination. But I think this kind of segues us into a lot of the, the, the conversations that we've had today. So we talked about, you know, medical services. We talked about, because Planned Parenthood is generally affecting what happens in, in low income communities. You know, it's, it's everyone, but the problems in low income communities. So how do we take the drug academic, I mean, epidemic that we started this conversation with, um, reproductive rights and things like that, and talk about how all of this impacts people in lower income communities? You talking about poor folks, people impoverished, poor folks, black folks. How, do, how, do, how, how does what? How does Planned Parenthood impact? It? Well, no, all the things that we're talking about uh, is the treatment in lower income communities different than in higher income communities. Mm-hmm. I think in a higher income community, because because let's let's just get this because we talked about it. But the deal is this: health department and Planned Parenthood provide the same women's reproductive services. And okay. Dr. House Hartridge also said they provide services for men as well. The thing that the health department does not provide are abortion sure. services. So Planned Parenthood is going to be under the spotlight because they do provide those services for that purpose, even though they would say that abortion services only account for 3% of the total amount of services that they actually provide. They are they so they're spotlighted politically because no one else is providing those services for the public at large. People that have the means are going to their private, private doctors, doctors to have those services done. So they're going to be under the spotlight. And also, given the issue, the going with the current president and his son, his son-in-law and his daughter, they're going to be under the spotlight. So Planned Parenthood is going to be on. They're, they're going to be there. But, they're a political organization, and they delve in the political realm. That's why Dr. House Hunter was saying, vote for the candidate of your choice and find out what their platform is going to be on those issues because that's where anything affecting Planned Parenthood is going to be affected. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. I understand all of that. I am sim- simply saying they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater over the don't 3%. Say percent. Don't say that. Well, okay. They're throwing the cat out of the the, kid, the litter box. Robbing Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> exactly. Whatever. Because of 3%. It's though. cutting off, you know. Wait, because, because of 3%. And the 3% that they weren't even paying money toward. But now... Uh, you know, I but that's because you have, but that's because you have so many pro-life people that are making laws for the country, and, and mostly you, are men. Well, they may be, <laughs> and, and mostly are men. They are oh, they men, are. and They're I understand percentage-wise in the Congress, you got more men. And, you I, and I understand, I understand uh, the why the why women feel the way they do about it. I feel the way they do about it. No one should be telling anyone what to do with their body. Yes, we get that, but the reality is this: you have pro-lifers that are the majority in Congress right now. And as long as, and, and when I say Congress, I mean all Congress. Sure. I, mean, I don't mean just House of Representatives. I mean House of Representatives and Senate and the executive branch. So those initiatives that are um, akin and associated with that party, the Republican Party, which one of them being, uh, I wouldn't say abortion control, but. Right to life. Right to life. That's what they call it. Uh, those are going to be the things that are going to be on the table as part of the agenda to get to get moving. So as Dr. House Hunter said, again. If you want to deal with Planned Parenthood and the issue of abortions and the funding that they're getting, that's something that's only going to be resolved with your vote. Now, as it relates to, uh, I guess, from a public health perspective, and we talk about abortions, uh, how is that? Is that is that a public health concern that you all are having? Is there is there are abortions now happening at a higher rate, lower rate? I think the sort of leveling off last that that I checked in terms of rate. But is that growing to any level of, of concern with you all right now as far as 
pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies or teenage well, pregnancies? What we focus on very heavily is reducing infant mortality. Okay. Mm. So Shelby County historically has had higher right. rates of infant mortality, and we know if pregnancies are planned and there's adequate spacing between pregnancies and moms are supported to breastfeed, it reduces our infant mortality rate. And so that's actually where our heavy emphasis is. We don't keep data at the health department on abortion rates at all. Right. We're really focused on healthy moms, healthy babies, and healthy families, and helping women have the information they need to make the right choice about reproductive health. So, so let's talk about, let's let's talk about what Hold on, let me ask you. Let me ask, I want to follow up on go that. Back to do, no, do any, do any health departments keep information uh, that you know of as, as a public health professional any health departments keep information on the number of abortions, and if that's the case, then how do they know how many are being had, uh, being had every year? Somebody knows this number. They're generally reported by the agencies right. that do Conduct them, them. Okay. but they don't report to the health department. So okay, each okay. state right. has mandatory reporting laws. Gotcha. Certain things are reported to us. Let's just say uh, syphilis rates. Yeah. If you if someone has syphilis, they have to report that to us. Someone has TB, they have to report that to us. If right. someone has an abortion, that's not reported to a health department, gotcha. either local or state. Gotcha. Okay. So from a you said educating women on making choices and families on making choices. One thing you said about you said the amount of pregnancies and the time between pregnancies and things like that. Yeah. Could you just because there are people that are listening that probably are saying the same thing to me, same as me. What does that mean uh, as far as women? Is there an amount of time in between, and and how uh, the healthy pregnancy process? What does that really consist of? So to to have a healthy pregnancy, mm -hmm. it's important that women are healthy in general. Right. So they eat well, sleep well, do the basics. Right. Um, we really encourage people to take folic acid so that they're healthy and um, don't have babies with neural tube defects. And then once someone has a baby, we uh, really encourage them to wait at least eighteen months to wow. have another baby. If you have the spacing a little bit wider, the babies tend to be healthier, and you have lower rates of infant mortality. Well, let me ask you that now, because my sister and I, and this is this is personal, my sister and I were born in the same year. Mm -hmm. She was born January 16th of 66. I was born December 10th of 66. So apparently there was not an 18-month wait. And the evidence is, is clear. <laughs> well, no, but now, <laughs> literally, no, but now, that, there, there, was, there are plenty of babies that are born closer together, sure. but the research and the data tells us if they're spaced further apart, they tend to be healthier and have lower rates of infant mortality. The other is if women have had a premature birth previously, we really encourage them to get into prenatal care earlier because right. there's ways now to, to help prevent that um, early delivery. Wow, what amazing. I tell yeah. you. Yeah. Latanya, you got that look on your face like, you know, I'm on my third kid here and I want to talk to him. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> right, let's yeah. get it right because my yeah. husband might listen. No, no. One child. <laughs> he is listening. Yeah. What did you get? There's one kid. One that's child. It. Yeah, don't, you know what, don't put that into our house. We've had fun here <laughs> talking today and we, we hope that you have gotten a lot out of this conversation with Dr. Elisa Househalter, who happens to be the division director for the Shelby County Health Department. And you're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. change my ways I want to make Memphis a better place I see a neighbor in me but what can be done instead of buying shoes or a pretty dress with just a dollar a month you can help the rest it starts with you plus one you know giving back through plus one will make a difference for families in crisis it starts with you plus one grandma's message couldn't happen I remember when we got help from Plus One. And now we have been other. Hey, Memphis, you can make a change. You too can make a difference. The off year electorate, the midterm electorates, are older, less diverse, more conservative. You have two electorates fighting for the future of this country. And what I'd say to your viewers and, and people listening in, is you know what? You got to stop that older, more, less diverse electorate from bunking it around with your future. Funking up your airwaves and jamming the good information in your ear. Once again, it's Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Funky Politics is on. We always say the revolution will not be televised, but it will be podcast on Funky Politics. 
politics. But DCA, we had a little bit of the revolution not too long ago as Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm not going to say celebrated. You don't celebrate someone no. being assassinated. But Memphis, they tried, Tennessee, though. <laughs> yeah. they Memphis, tried. Tennessee commemorated the life and the legacy of Martin Luther King on the 50th anniversary of his assassination uh, just recently. And I know that you were a participant in a lot of the events there, and you really got a chance to get into the essence of it. Can you talk to us about that as we go on out? What do we need to do now? What's the state of the dream? Where the, are we going? You know, the, the question was, where do we go from here? Yeah. And if uh, the MLK 50 activities I saw uh, were the impetus for that, then we're lost. Wow. Until the next 50 years. That's a strong I statement. saw complete disunity. I saw four or five major organizations in my city that are, and some that are national flub this thing. Instead of us coming to the table and working and saying, look, this man deserves all the honor and praise. He's not Jesus Christ, but he was someone who walked uh, walked around with a lot of our grandparents and our parents, and they talked with each other, and, and he tried to spur us to something that was greater than what we were. And we could not sit at one table and decide on five or six or seven or 20 things that we could all do together in terms of unity. Wow. I saw several organizations do their own thing, and I tell you what, it was disheartening. Wow, but but I mean, but if you're watching like I did, a lot of things I was spectating, watching on television. Sure, it seemed like things that were going along went along in a very good and streamlined fashion. Oh, were they scripted well? No, some of them were extremely scripted well. But understand this: when you've got a major piece going on at one venue, and you've got another one going on at, at another venue, and they're, and they're similar. But all they had to do was bring them to one particular event, and we could all enjoy together, black and white, labor, and business together. Wow! And we had them all separated and segregated. It was it was it so was you're saying, absolutely. So you're saying the barriers of race, class, and other uh, class areas are still affecting us class. even 50 years after, yes. even when we're celebrating yes. the man yeah. that had a dream that all of those things would be. Uh, that we would all of, all the barriers that divide us. Ask would the be average down. Memphian, ask the average Tennessean, wow. ask the average Mid South person who came. How many of them participated in any of that stuff? A bunch of this stuff was private ticketed. Some of it you couldn't get into. Right. You turned away. You arrested activists on a day that Are you, you were me? supporting. The, the life and legacy of a man who believed Are in activism. Are you that the revolution won't be televised, but it'll be sold to the highest bidder? That's what happened. Wow. That's deep. That's deep. That's what we do. But, but, I guess, but I guess it just goes to the bigger question. Why are you asking yourself where do we go from here 50 years later? No. That was a, that question for 1969, not, not 2018. But you've got to start somewhere, and hopefully this will be the start of a series of us coming together as people. Yeah. To understand that each of us has a worth, each of us has a mission, and it is our duty to help each and every one of us do what we can to make this world a better place. Isn't that right, Elsie? I'll focus on the least of us. We must never forget you that you have to do the work for the least of us. And so out of all of that that happened, the one thing that I'm proud to see is that labor unions, the fight for 15, and all of those people represented well and represented yeah. the diversity of this country. They were here. And they, they were strong. Were here, and, and, they were strong. and they were united. Yes, they were. And as we said that. before, diversity is the only way by which we win, no matter where we are. We have to continue to celebrate the best and the brightest of each of us. But until next time, it's time for us to get off our heels, get on our wheels, and truck on out of here. But until then, we always implore you, demand you, command that you keep it real, keep it right, and keep it what, LT? Funky. Keep it what, DC? Funky, funky. Keep it funky, funky, funky right here on Funky Politics. Funky Politics executive producer Larry Robinson for Kudzukin. Hosted by Daryl DC Katron and Marcus M.D. Ward. Guest bookings by Miko. Funky Politics recorded at Kudzukian Studio. Directed, produced, recorded, and distributed by Kudzukian. 